Okay, in physics, you're probably going to do electric circuits. And you're also going to do electric fields and electric potential. So here's a way that these things are related. Uh, we're going to get to Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's law using electric field and electric potential. So let's get started. So first, these things, we call them laws, Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's loop law or rule, they call them, you call it either way. But I mean, I want you to realize that these are just models. They're not, they're not the law. I mean, we, we use the word law in a different way in science, and it's more of a generic model that has many different parts. So just, just remember that, that these are just models that work very well. Uh, also, I'd like to, to recognize that my favorite physics textbook, Matter and Interactions, uh, published by Wiley, you should buy in Sherwood. Great source for all this stuff. You should check it out. It's awesome. Okay, so let's imagine that we have a charge in a constant electric field in space. And so if you apply a force on a constant, on a charge, it's going to accelerate. And we could calculate the change in speed. We could calculate everything we want. But uh, charges aren't always in free space. A lot of times we have these metal conductors. So if I have a metal, what's my model for the, the motion of a particle in a metal? So let's say this is copper. Copper has uh, protons and electrons. And the protons in copper are in the nucleus, and these nuclei form this atomic lattice uh, structure where they're pretty much set. They move around some, but they're not they're not really able to move around too much. The key thing with the metal is that the outer electron is able to kind of move around to different copper atoms. So these, so we can think of it as these locked positive charges with a uh, negative charges that are free to move around. And so that's what we have. Now, if I apply an electric, a constant electric field inside of this, where we have other atoms, this we get something like this for the motion of a charged particle. So it's, these white dots are like other atoms randomly spaced about. The charge accelerates until it interacts with an atom and it slows down and then it starts accelerating again. Uh, every time it slows down, it, what happens to its energy? Well, that energy goes to thermal energy of the material and that's why when you l run electric current through a metal, they get hot. But if I plotted the velocity as a function of time, and this is actually the same data for that same animation that you just saw, the, it speeds up, it stops, it speeds up, it stops. Uh, and the, the distance between collisions is not set, so the time of speeding up is not the same. But we can still get an average velocity. It's as though it travels with an average velocity, and we call this the drift velocity. If I increase the value of the electric field, the charge is still going to have collisions, but it will speed up more in between those collisions, so it will have a higher drift velocity. So we can model this as though they are going with some constant speed that's proportional to the electric field. This proportionality constant is called the electron, or it's called the charge mobility U, and it depends on the material properties that, the, that you're running the electric current through. Okay, so what if I keep adding, I apply this electric field, and that makes these negative electric charges accelerate to the left, collide, speed up, but overall it looks like they're moving with a constant speed to the left. Uh, and then I keep adding electrons to the right-hand side of that wire. Well, I can keep this flow of charge going forever. If you don't add electrons, they'll stop because you'll have charges build up on one side and then you'll get a, a zero electric field inside the wire. This uh, adding of charge with time is what we call the electric current. So the electric current is defined as the time rate of change of charge, the change in charge over the change in time. I can also define this electric current in terms of the drift velocity. So imagine I have these charges moving at a constant speed. Well, the more charges I have, the greater the current, and that's my Q, the, the charge carrier value, okay? Uh, how much charge is on each carrier. N is the number of carriers per unit volume. It's the charge carrier density. A is the cross-sectional area of that wire. A wider wire is gonna have more current, just like a, you can think of this as a water pipe. A wider pipe is gonna have uh, more water flow. And then V is drift velocity. 
I can replace the drift velocity with the mobility times the electric field and we get this really important thing that says the electric current is proportional to the electric field inside of the wire. Okay, what about a battery? A battery is really important because that's the easiest way to apply electric field inside of a wire and make a current. So if we want to think about a battery, we have this idea called electromotive force. And it's an older term, okay, but it still is pretty valid. And the idea is, imagine I have these negative charges on the left plate. And these charges, uh, once they're con it's like a capacitor. And once these charges are on that plate, it's going to make an electric field in the wire on that side. And if, it's all, if the wire is connected to something, you'll get a current. That would reduce the number of charges on that plate. But the battery has this, it's like a conveyor belt in there. And this conveyor belt takes negative charges from the right plate and moves them to the left plate. And that leaves negative, uh, an absence of negative charges makes this side positive. And so then you are able to maintain an electric potential difference from one plate to the other through this conveyor belt idea. It's not actually a conveyor belt. I mean, you could actually do this with a conveyor belt. Uh, the Van de Graaff generator essentially does that. But in the case of most batteries, this is a chemical reaction that moves a negative charges from one side to the other side of the plate. And then we call it the electromotive force. So what if I take this simple battery and I connect it to a wire that goes from one end to the other? So here I have positive uh, charges on the right plate, and that's going to make a, an electric field going to the right over here. And then so these charges will build up on the surface of the wire and make an electric field in the direction of the wire. Now, I have a couple of things. The distance between the plates, I'm going to call that S. And then inside, I actually do get, it's just like a capacitor, so I get an electric field going from the left to the right. And then I have this path around the rest of the wire, I'm going to call that length L, and it has a direction, I mean, a, the wire has a cross-sectional area of A. So look at this little white dot here on the left plate. That's the point that I want to start and calculate the change in potential. Since the electric field is conservative, if I calculate the uh, integral of the electric field over some distance and I start and end at the same point, I should get to zero. So let's do that. So let's say the change in potential from A going through the capacitor and then through the wire and then back to A should be zero. So I get E times B, the EB, the electric field inside of the uh, battery times S, that's that change in potential. And then the other is the electric field in the wire times the length of the wire. And that one's gonna be negative because I'm going in the same direction as the electric field, but that has to add up to zero. The EBS is the EMF. That is the electromotive force across that battery. And so that has to be equal to the electric field in the wire times the length of the wire. Because those two things have to add up to zero because the potential is zero. Now I can use the definition of the electric current, which I saw before, which depends on the electric field, EW. And I can solve for the electric field due to the wire, and I get I divided by Q, the charge carrier value, in the number of charge carriers per unit volume, the cross-sectional area A, and the electron mobility. So now let's put all of this together. So here I have the change in potential across the wire is E wire times L. And that's equal to, all right, my expression for E wire is I over Q in AU, and all I need to do is multiply that by L. If I factor out the I, I get this. And all of this stuff in parentheses depends on the property of the wire. How long is the wire with the charge carrier, the charge carrier density, the cross-functional area, and the mobility. Those are all properties of the wire. And so I can call that the resistance. The resistance is going to be L over all these wire properties. Now, there's actually two, there's properties of the material, Q, N, and U. Those depend on what kind of, is it copper, is it iron, is it aluminum? Those are material properties. And then there are physical properties that depend on the shape of the wire, the length and the area. So I can actually factor those out and I get 
uh, I could say the resistance is L over A times the resistivity rho. So R is the resistance in ohms and re rho is the resistivity in ohm meters. And so here you get Ohm's law. Uh, this says that the change of potential across a wire is I times R, where we can define R in terms of the properties of that wire. Okay, what about the loop rule? Here's a slightly more complicated circuit. I have the battery, and then I have three wires. Here I have a thick wire, and then I have a thin wire in the middle, and then a thick wire again. Again, I can use the change in electric potential around a loop, and I get four pieces. I first go across the battery, and I get EMF, and then I have the electric field in wire one. It's E1 times the length of wire one, and then I get E2 times the length of wire two, and then E3 times the length of wire three, and all those have to add up to zero. That's the loop rule. This is just a property of the conservation of energy. Remember, the electric potential is a type of energy that we move to the other side of the equation. Uh, it's work done by the electric field, but since the electric field does not, the work done by the electric field does not depend on path, the change in electric potential around a loop has to be zero. Okay, here is the other rule, the junction rule. So let's look at these two little white dots down here at in between at length one, wire one, and wire two. If I measure the current in the dot on the right and the dot on the left, they're in two different wires with two different areas, they have to have the same electric current. If they don't, if the change in current in wire two is lower than the change in current, a change in charge in wire one, then I'm gonna get charge buildup at that junction and that would change the electric field. Uh, if, if it's the other way around, I'd get charge uh, decrease. So in order to be in a steady state situation, the total charge flow has to be constant. This is just like a pipe. Imagine a thick pipe with water going to a thin pipe with water. In order for the water flow rate, the mass flow rate to be constant, then the, the, they have to be the same in those two pipes. Now they'll have different speeds, that's okay but they have to have the same flow rate. Same thing true for charge. If I use my definition for electric current, uh, I can see that the current depends on both the area of the wire and the electric field in the wire. Uh, and so these have two different areas and two different electric fields. Uh, I'm assuming they're the same kind of wire, they're the same material. So Q, N, and U would all be the same. So I get, they cancel and I get that. Uh, I could also do the same thing for going from wire 2 to 3, and I get this. So all of these currents have to be the same because the current coming into a junction has to be the current coming out of a junction. If I solve this for E2, I get E2 is a ratio of the areas to the uh, multiplied by the electric field in E1. Now imagine A2 is very skinny. It's a very thin wire. If the diameter is small, compared to the uh, electric, the diameter of the wire L1, then the electric field in E2 is going to be very much larger than E1 because we're squaring, it's, a, it's the area, so you go by the distance squared uh, for the cross-section area. Well, let's put this together with the loop rule. And if I do that, there's my loop rule, EMF, E1, E2, and E3 times their length. Uh, and then I substitute in, uh, I, actually the first thing I do is factor out E, uh, L1 and L2 have the same area, so they have to have the same electric field. So if I substitute in E1 instead of E3, I can factor out that uh, part. And then I can substitute in my E2, and I get this. So now I have just an expression for E1, and I can solve for the electric field in E1, and it depends on these properties. Um, I could then go back and solve for E2 also. But you'll notice here that, like I said, if uh, area 2 is very, very small compared to area 1, then E1 is also going to be very, very, very small. And so that almost you could ignore E1 in a lot of cases. So this is using the loop rule with electric fields and electric potential. 
Now, here's the more traditional way to look at this, to say, okay, I have a battery. I've drawn it as these two wires, a long wire and a short wire. That's the way we draw it. And instead of drawing a thick and thin wire, I just have a thing we draw as a resistor. And then we can say the loop rule is the EMF of the battery minus IR. And then there is no junction rule really here. Uh, but you'll notice here that uh, I'm saying there's no potential drop across the connecting wires to the resistor. And that would mostly be true. Okay, If you have thick wires, the resistance of those thick wires is very, very small compared to the resistor. OK, so what do we learned here? Well, we have Kirchhoff's loop rule. This is just the conservation of energy for the work done by electric fields. So the change of potential around any loop has to be 0. Kirchhoff's junction rule. This is just saying charge is conserved. I can't lose charge when I go from one wire to the other. And then finally, we have the idea that the electric field is still there. And that's the point that I'm trying to make. We can do loop rules and junction rules and talk about current and resistance, but it's still really about the electric field and the electric potential. It's not some different section of physics. It's all about electric fields. Okay, I hope that helps you think about these things in a little bit different way, and I'll talk to you guys later.